such a warm welcome, and Marianne and I both are so happy to be here. We want to thank the Humanities Festival, the Chicago Humanities Festival, and all of the donors, the investors, the people who plant the seeds and make to make this happen. And then all of you that are spending a Saturday morning with us, Marianne. Yep. Yeah, that is a beautiful thing in Chi Town. <laughs> in Chi Town. So I don't know, there was this uh, thing called a midterm election that just happened. Yeah, I heard that happen. Yeah. I don't know, we should just really get into that and uh, branch off into other things, but can you share some of your thoughts about what went down in almost the final analysis? We know that some races have not been called yet. Is there any impact to this election cycle, not just on the next one, but the ripple effect moving beyond even 2024? Well, I think, and this is certainly um, not a unique perspective, I think Americans um, said with this election, let, maybe let's not be crazy. Um, <clears throat> so I think that uh, the country demanded a return to what I hope is a kind of golden mean. Um, I think the best uh, aspect of the American character, which is the truth of who we are, is a level of decency and dignity and intelligence. And I think that this, um, this election the other night, there was decency and dignity and intelligence that we sorely needed in American politics because we haven't seen it for a while. So I hope that the phenomenon, and I know it's not over, but the, the, uh, the primacy of this really almost insane pathological political um, assault on the deepest foundations of democracy, we were talking before we got here, um, may we one day look back at that, the way we look back at the McCarthy era. Yeah. Now, it was this horrible thing that happened, and then it ended. That would be my hope, that the red wave, it's more than that it didn't happen. I hope it goes back to C now, and that we never see it again. Amen to that. <laughs> we will see if it goes back to C. Uh, most of that is certainly in our hands. Although there was not a red wave, there certainly was a ripple and we still have to be concerned about that ripple, I believe, especially in state legislatures. I wanna take my great state of Ohio, for example. Uh, Republicans there have a super, 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 super majority in the legislature. All the statewide offices have been, are controlled. You know, so we have certain states in the union where the power center is still very much on the deep red side <coughs> of the scale, with people not even caring about the basic needs of the people they, they took an oath of office to be able to serve. So in some ways, I am concerned about not just what happens on the federal level, as I know you are, but also what is happening in, on the state levels across this country. People on the left side of the political spectrum for a very long time have had a tendency to be involved in the midterms and the presidential election. That's where the sort of adrenaline is, they're a little sexier, and have in a way that the Republicans have not done, almost ignored um, state and uh, local politics. And I think with the overturn of Roe v. Wade, that era had to end. People now realize ground zero has gone to the states. That's right. So, and, and I think not only the realization that we have to care about state politics and local politics every bit as much as federal, is the realization that we can no longer farm out our, our democracy, we can no longer farm out our citizenship. Um, it's kind of like what happened over the last few decades with steak versus parsley. So when I'm growing up, people looked at the steak on your plate, that's where your health came, and that parsley was just this little bit of nothing that you didn't need. The world is so changed now, we realize the steak will kill you, but you really need that parsley. <laughs> so that's how we have to look at our citizenship. We used to look at it as a little thing on the side of the plate, and we'll show up for the midterms or the, or the, or the federal. No, it, this, is a really an, this whole era represents a crisis in our democracy. We have to show up for our citizenship. Our citizenship has to become a layer of what we believe constitutes a meaningful life. The good news is I think people are ready to do that. And, uh, the country will change when we do. Yeah, Love lifted me when nothing else would help. Love lifted me. That is a song in the Christian spiritual tradition. You know a whole lot about that, uh, pushing for us as a people, as a culture, to see love as a strength. Um, there are others in this stratosphere who believe the same thing, and either, even others who came before us. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. comes to mind when he talks about how hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. So when I say that on the backdrop of 
what is happening in the political sphere. And you still, do you still believe that, that when nothing else can help, love can lift us? When you look at all the great social justice movements of the United States, in our history, they were rooted in love. Uh, the abolitionist movement emerged from the early evangelical churches in New Hampshire. Uh, many of the women who were the leading suffragist movements uh, leaders were um, Quakers. Dr. King, of course, was a Baptist preacher. Um, all the great movements for the expansion of our democracy, the expansion of rights, are a stand for the expansion of the possibilities of, of human self-actualization. That is what love is. So the, the moral vision at the core, even of the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, arises from what is basically a spiritual concept, that the truth of who we are is equal. That, to me, to recognize that is love. There is a man named Dr. James Doty. He wrote a book called Into the Magic Shop. I don't know if you and I have talked about this. He is a neurosurgeon at Stanford. His story is really interesting, but I'm just gonna skip away from much of the story because we probably don't have the time, as interesting as it is. But his work, he's at Stanford, he's a neurosurgeon, but he is joined with the Dalai Lama and they have formed at Stanford the Center for Compassion. And his, what he talks about is how the furthest regions of science now, they are recognizing that where there has been the assumption that the brain was the intelligent center of the body, they now realize a partnership between the brain and the heart that they didn't even know existed the way it, they now realize it does. And, that the, the, and what we're seeing in civilization, too, is that the brain, separate from the heart, is insane. This is why Dr. Martin Luther King said, power without love yeah. is reckless and abusive, and that is what a political power in America has become, yeah. reckless and abusive, because it is power without love. But he said, love yeah, without right. power it's is weak and anemic. And I think the future of our democracy, but even more importantly, the future of our species, um, lies in our willingness and ability to integrate and then express that deep partnership and integration between power and love. Yeah, I can get with that. <clears throat> love is p a powerful force, it's not a weak force. And if it is not passive, Yes. If it is expressed, if it's just a heart on your Instagram, right. or, you know, well, everybody's doing their best. No, Hitler was not doing his best. You know, there's an expression of love these days. It's a little like um, lacking in force, and we could talk about whether or not that is the true expression of love. Love can be fierce. We know this as it mothers. Is. Sometimes love says no. Yeah, love says no. Love will protect, chastise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mess with my kids. Hey, yeah. you got and a that problem. that is love, too. That's it. <laughs> No matter how grown they are, you know. But that's the part, because some people take love as this mushy yeah. thing, but it is a fierce force. Love will cause you to act and also to react. The embodiment of the abolitionist movement, for example, was about a type of love. That love coming first, though, from black people who needed to be liberated and expanding out to co-conspirators to say that we love this country enough, we love what we should stand for enough to fight against the status quo. It's the same thing with the suffer suffragist movement, the same thing with the gay rights movement. It's the same thing with any movement that elevates human, it forces human nature to elevate beyond its selfish machinations. To me, that's what love, love fights. You know, love is not always cuddly. Love struggles, certainly love yeah. struggles. And if needed, I mean, if you look at something like World War II, um, the, you know, I'm fascinated reading biographies of people like Franklin Roosevelt. You know what he called the Nazis? Those unworthy men. He didn't get into a lot of emotionality, and you know, that was part of his strength. Um, it was simply something that had to be done. In the Bible, um, when, um, at the, when, when the Red Sea parted, so the Red Sea parts and the um, and the Egyptian soldiers ran in. The Israelites ran in. They were able to make it through the tunnel that was created in the sea. So the Egyptian soldiers ran after them, and they were. That's when the water came back over them, and they were all drowned. And the Israelites uh, began to celebrate and jump up and down. They were all excited, and God said, "No, someone had to die for me to save you." 
It had to happen, but you will not celebrate the death of another human being, even if it needed to be. And I think that's really important too. So you bring me to another question then, the power of sacrifice. And sacrifice doesn't always have to be a physical death, but I kind of feel as though people talk a good game, and especially with the advent of social media, and you can be on Twitter, kind of, sort of, don't get me started on Elon, but um, you can be on Twitter and all the social media, and you can hide behind these avatars and not really be truly who you are. I mean, some of the rhetoric that floats around social media, I don't think a lot of people would have the courage to say, especially the negative stuff, to somebody in their, in their, in their face. But the whole notion of how do we use the incredible tools at our disposal, that's one, and then two, do you think we're at a moment where people are really willing to sacrifice? I'm not talking about lives, but sacrifice and be uncomfortable. You sacrificed, you ran uh, for <coughs> president. I have sacrificed, I've run for numerous offices. I was on a national campaign with Senator Bernie Sanders. And when you don't fit the, the grain of the status quo, that is a sacrifice of <coughs> self. Do you believe that we are at a state in this country where people are willing to sacrifice for a greater good? Well, first of all, we've proven throughout our history that we are. The issue is, is this generation ready? I, I, two things come up for me. One is the difference between the word sacrifice and the word renunciation. I don't believe truth, God, love demands sacrifice. So renunciation to me is a more powerful word, a more relevant word. You choose, you forego the lower in order to achieve the higher. Um, so are we ready to renounce? Which means in terms of personality structure, are we ready to be courageous enough uh, to go forward in the ways we need to go forward in this country? And you and I um, know that if you say what the status quo, particularly in a political context, if you say what the status quo uh, does not declare as um, the established truth, that they are willing to um, articulate. Uh, they will do whatever it takes uh, to get you out of the conversation. Don't I know it. And they will, we, we both know yeah. it, and we both have the scars to prove it. Yeah. So yes, I don't think of that as are we ready to sacrifice, but are we ready to have the courage? Um, if we don't speak up and we don't act, that's the sacrifice, the sacrifice of your integrity, the sacrifice of the purpose of your life. That's the deeper sacrifice. Are we willing to have the courage to go forward? And of course, that's a conversation you and I have all the time. All the time. Do I think that the American people, I think we showed with the midterm elections the other day, um, an intelligence. You look at, you know, this is a country that elected Abraham Lincoln. This is the country that elected Franklin Roosevelt four times. This is a country that has proven that in the presence of leadership that does point to the North Star of democracy and righteousness, despite whatever systems um, dictate, that the country, yes, is willing to go. But you and I know um, the institutional resistance to what we might perceive as the deepest, most loving truth at this time. So I think what you're really saying to me is not, are the American people ready? What you and I are really saying is, you ready? Are you ready? Because I'm ready you if you're ready. ready. I'm ready. You and I are we saying ready. to each other. That's what you're really <laughs> saying, you ready, Mary? Because I don't know if I'm ready or we ready. And there are millions like us. And what we hope, of course, is that if we do saunter out there in whatever way we might, that there would be enough people to say, yeah, actually, I agree with We're her. Ready That's too. the question. As we saunter out there. I like that. There's going to be a lot of sauntering going on. I want to bring somebody in the room from the past, but I believe that her essence and spirit still drives, and that's Congresswoman Barbara Jordan from the great state of Texas. Texas, where I come from. Yeah, I mm -hmm. know you're a Texas girl. <laughs> and she once said, what the people want is very simple. They want an America as good as is promised. Marianne, what is an America, in your estimation, <coughs> as good as it's promised? I see our Declaration of Independence as our moral mission statement. Um, all men are created equal. That right there was radical in 1776 and it's radical today. That all men are created equal. All men given by God inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That a gov the governments are instituted to secure those rights not to thwart those rights, but to secure those rights, and that if government does not do it, that job, the people have the right to alter it or abolish it. Mm -hmm. That is its promise. Now, 
Of the 56 men who signed that document, and let's remember they were risking their lives by so doing, because if the British had won the Revolutionary War, those men would have been executed as traitors. However, 41 of the 56 signers were slave owners. So it's baked into the cake here that we are both the promise on which we purport to stand and forces within our population that for their own economic purposes are willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that that promise is not actualized. And I think when we see that that is the story, the, the often tragic story of the United States and the often glorious story of the United States is the tension and the struggle between our promise and our willing to compromise with it or even to transgress against it. Every generation is a reiteration of that struggle. We've, we've all heard the phrase, in order to form a more perfect union. We've never totally manifest our promise. We've no, nobody think, is it claiming that we have, but it's the job of every generation is to actualize it as best we can. We want to expand ri uh, rights for LBGTQ people. We want to expand rights for people of color. We want to expand rights for, for women. We want to expand rights for, for animals even. Some of us do. Yes, we want to expand rights of the earth. And then there are also the forces who, once again, for their own economic purposes, um, institutionally resist that. We are living out that struggle today, just as other generations have lived it out before. Yeah, listening to you say, and I'm glad you injected the, they were slave owners in the room, because I was thinking to myself, yeah, they said all those nice words, but they didn't really mean them. I, I, I do believe. However, some of them did. Some of them did, but the the fact that that those words are foundational gives us the ability to try to live up to them was going to be the other part. But I wanted to say about the generational struggle, though. You made me think about my track days when I used to run track and I was fast, and um, I relive it in my mind quite often those days. <laughs> But the 440 relay came to mind, Mary, and when you said that every generation has that responsibility, and to me, the 440 relay is a great visual of that, where you have these four people who have to run in sync. They gotta be in time with one another, even though each has their own leg of the race to run. And what is the charge of the first leg of the race? Well, the first leg's job is to advance the lead. And we can wrap all kinds of stuff around what does it mean to advance the lead. In the second leg of the race, you pass the baton, you gotta be in sync. You pass it too fast or too slow, it could drop, it could fall, right? And then you lose ground. But if you are in sync, the second anchor gets the baton and their job is to keep the lead and advance the lead and so on and so forth until you get to the anchor. But in life, unlike the anchor crossing the finish line and they're winning, for us in life, there's never really a finish line. That's what I interpret you saying, that every generation <clears throat> has to run that 440 relay. Well, we hope there won't be a finish line. We hope that our country will continue, and every generation is a chapter in a book that has not ended. That's just like our lives, every yeah. chapter. And every generation gets to choose uh, how it writes its own chapter. But when you talk about advancing the lead, I think we need to honor our ancestors more. What did the abolitionists do except advance the lead? Yeah, what did the suffragists I mean. do except advance the lead? You know, I feel, Nina, that there are people in this country who we all recognize only want to talk about what America has done right and don't have any sense of responsibility to recognize our shadows, where we have done it wrong, where we do it wrong now, to reckon with our past, et cetera. But I think there are also people, particularly people on the left, actually, who only want to talk about what we've done wrong and have no listening for what we've done right. Even on that issue of the founders, it was both and. It was both and. That, to me, is the meaning of our story. And we're both and now. But I also think that so much of the work is within ourselves. We are, where am I both and? Um, I think that the um, transformation of our country right now, you know, there's a lot of talk about the, the shift from transactional politics to transformational politics. Transactional is, you know, we'll just change this policy. Transformational is the realization, if we don't change the underlying root causes that gave birth to that malevolence, that the symptom will return. And then I have to look into the malevolence within my own heart. And, that, and I think that this is a really important time for that. Even though my politics are on the left, lefties have their own smug self-righteousness. Oh, no doubt. Uh, our own meanness at people who don't agree with us on every little thing. Um, and I think 
you know, it's not a black and white world on any level. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with, the, I agree with most of what you said. I would say that when it comes to the, so this, <coughs> when Dr. Cornel West says that justice is what love looks like, you know, in, in public, mm -hmm. I mean, that's really what we're embracing and that's what we're as talking about. As a politics about. of love. As that's politics right. of love. I will say that when you are though, and I agree with you that some on the, so when we talk about the left and then there's progressives and there's neoliberals and we can label folks, right. I do agree that there is this, tug of war going on that can hurt the psychology of all of us, that right. it is truly both and. Mm -hmm. I wanna put a however on that. In the critique of the founding of this nation though, if you are on the receiving end of the horror, if you are on the receiving end of the evilness, if you are on the receiving end of the inhumanity, it's kind of hard to say, oh, but there, some of them were good. And you know, I, I, I mean, I'm sorry, but, but I, you know I don't agree going. with that. I'm a Jew. There were yeah. some good Germans who hit us in the basement. Yeah, I, you I, know, I, and it's, so it's not hard for me to recognize I, that. For me, it I is. recognize the way the way Franklin Roosevelt turned Jews away. I still think he was one of the greatest presidents. You, life is nuanced, and history is nuanced. Oh, I got and that. And many of the uh, many of the people at the founding of this country, including signers, were abolitionists themselves. So. When you say you're on, uh, uh, I, I, we can come from a very, very oppressed people and still recognize that, that as much as the oppression was wrong, history is complicated and people are complicated. It is very complicated and it's beautiful that you and I can agree to disagree on this particular I don't see what we're point. disagreeing on there though because there are some facts there. No, I get that, but what I am saying that is easier to, if you're not on the receiving end of that, to be more open to. There is a, this is a both and nation, but we still have so much more work to do. And I do personally believe that rooted in the DNA of this country from its founding, yes, are those beautiful words, but beautiful words without beautiful actions don't, don't mean a whole lot. Okay, now I'm a white woman saying this, so I, but on the other hand, I don't think just because Martin Luther King was black, a white person can't point to the words he said. But he himself talked about how the words in the Declaration of Independence, the founding of this country, were what delivered to him. He said, we're just here to cash a check. To me, that's one of the reasons he was, number one, why he was so successful, and number one, why he's such a hero to us now, is that he did hold both and. He did hold both and. I've read so much of his, that the promise was brilliant, the promise was genius, and we must honor that and stand on that promise and realize that that promise is why we are able to so fiercely resist those who transgress against it. I would rather have those words than not have those words, but Dr. King also said that the check marked insufficient funds. He also said that we are a nation enamored with militarism. Well, I agree with that. I, 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 I think I've stood for that as so much as it is. I mean, it is Definitely. both of those things. Yeah, so, but that's my point. I mean, but you're right. I mean, we're not in this. It's just yeah. I'm leaning more on one side of it and you're on another. And so we balance each other out. <laughs> no, I don't think that that's what's happening here. I, my argument is not the other side from what you're saying. My, pro, my, my, um, my stance here is that it's nuanced and it's both and and it's complicated and life is messy and democracy is messy and the juxtaposition of all those things is what's so painful sometimes, but we must stand for that which we believe is true. I don't mean the other side in that we're not, we're on the same side, we're on the we side sure of are. justice. So, <laughs> but even in that justice, you know, we can have this yeah. robust conversation yeah. which we are having right now. For people who have lost hope, Mary Ann, who say, you know what, we we not gonna make it, at least in my lifetime. You know, and there are a lot of people who kind of feel that way. Yeah. What would you say to them? Well, first of all, um, cynicism is just an excuse for not helping. So you don't you, you don't do the right thing in life because you think it's going to work. You do the right thing in life because it's the right thing. Um, there were many abolitionists who thought we'll never pull this off, but they still struggled. There were many women suffragists uh, who I'm sure had their days when they thought this will never happen. They still stood. There were times when we know that Martin Luther King had days when he, he, he doubted. Jesus on the cross for that matter, but you still go forth. And so people who say it's never gonna work, you know, what's that line that everybody's out there saying? Those who doubt can just step aside while the rest of us go forward and do it. Um, uh, you don't do the right thing because you have the guarantee 
that it's going to work. You do the right thing because living a meaningful life means knowing that on the day you die, you know you kicked ass while you were here. Yeah, yeah. That statement or that sentiment reminds me of a quote, I don't know who said it, but they talked a, a little bit about how we should plant trees whose shade we may never enjoy. You know, I was reading once about the great cathedrals of Europe, yeah. the great uh, Catholic cathedrals, and it was talking about how these, um, I think it was a Henry James essay, and he was talking about how the people who worked on those cathedrals as workmen, and those cathedrals took hundreds of years to build. So people who dedicated their lives knew, knew that they were never going to see the, the um, cathedral finished. But also, you know what that essay was saying? That essay was saying, was pointing out that the building of the great cathedrals of Europe are among the greatest acts, works of genius in human history. And this, this uh, essay was talking about how they did it for, in their minds, the Virgin Mary. And that production of the masculine into the feminine is the highest level of genius and is the highest driving, of, driving force. Um, and I think that that sense of mother, tenderness, love, what the world could be, compels us to such an extent that those, those ancestors of ours who have demonstrated greatness knew whether I live to see this is irrelevant and whether I even survive the process is ultimately irrelevant, that real love is serving the ages, not just you and not just in your lifetime. Yeah, amen to that. What, what are you reading these days? What's what the latest? Am what am I reading these days? I'm reading about Thomas Paine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm reading about Thomas Paine. And uh, I've been reading a lot about Franklin Roosevelt. There's an incredible book called um, No Ordinary Time. I think I might have told mm -hmm. you about this mm -hmm. by Doris Kearns Goodwin about Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt during uh, the period of World War II. I love reading biographies. All these ideas that you and I talk about, when I, for me, when I actually read about individuals, the people in our history who actually grappled with these things, even Lincoln. I'm reading um, something about Lincoln. Oh, the new John Meacham book, uh, There Was Light, about Lincoln. I think sometimes we see people in history as cardboard characters. We fail to recognize they were smart as we are and smarter often, that they grappled with these things too. They grapple with their own pain. Do you know that Lincoln, um, they thought that the Civil War was going to take like six weeks, right, on both sides. They had no idea it was going to turn into what it turned into. Mm -hmm. And there are all these things written about Lincoln, um, and there's this one uh, thing written by his private secretary. And when they would come in and tell Lincoln into his office and tell him how many people died in a battle, because remember, they didn't expect any of this, sure. that Lincoln would put his head on his hands and he would rock back and forth, rock back and forth like in cabinet meetings and say, I cannot bear this. I cannot bear this. I just, when I go into the deep humanity, that's, that's what the politics that we need now comes from our deep humanity. That's the transformational aspect, not the transactional. Um, where is that place in us that feels the pain, is willing to walk through it, is willing to sacrifice, as you said, um, to renounce? That's what's going to take us forward. Not all this stuff, something deep in here, something deep in here. It has to be deep. Has to be deep. Has to be real. Mm -hmm. That's where you and I, I think, you and I are, you know, women who are willing to be mischievous and say the quiet part out loud That's and say it. it even though they don't like that we said it. That's right. We, we get off on doing that. We do get off yeah, on I doing that. It. I'm going to say it again. You didn't like it. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> That's where you and I love each other. Ooh, I yes. heard you say that. I know. I mean, <laughs> you said that. Was it Eleanor Roosevelt that said, well behaved women are. Rarely. Was she the one who said that? I don't know, but some, know some great said woman it. said it. Rarely I make think history. It that is Somebody a Google it real quick. Let me know who said it. But, you know, uh, she said well that if he wasn't women, my never. husband, I'd be voting for the socialist. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So well-behaved women are rarely written about in history. So ladies, let's misbehave. Let's do a whole lot of misbehaving <laughs> for justice. But women have to support other women in justice. doing it. I think that's where you and I felt the greatest pain when women have not. We, but not any women now, Marianne. Okay. What, you I'm don't think Liz Cheney's I'm calling you up No, he hex, no. I'm going to keep it PG. It might be some babies in here. <laughs> no. I mean, she voted, what, almost 100% of the time with Trump. She didn't support the, uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. 
as far as I'm concerned, it's easy to bump up against Trump. You're not getting no brownie points from me for fighting against Trump. It's the end thing to do. And so the fact that she's being propped up, especially by neoliberals, is quite painful to me. Marianne, how do you feel about that situation? <laughs> well, I think that my, I, I think I've, <laughs> I've done uh, enough to make clear my feelings about Trump. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, so Liz Cheney. My grandmother used to say a broke clock is right twice a day, so I guess, you know, we'll, we'll give her some brownie points. <laughs> For that. But you know, you and I have also talked. But, but about you know it. what I mean. I'm just saying that I'm. Neither one of us. We just won't support women just because we share some chromosomes. No, that's. I need I, you to share my sense of justice. Yeah. I need you to share. But yeah, but I was onto something else. Yeah. I was onto to uh, talking about women who do agree with us. Yes. But because we were laughed at or we were derided, were afraid to say I agree with her because they were afraid that if they supported us, they would be mocked or they would be derided. Oh, that's, yeah. that's the sisterhood oh, issue yeah. that I'm talking about. And you and I both have people in our lives who were not courageous enough to step up and be by our side because the neoliberal class didn't necessarily well, care. Well, I think it's, you know, I read a study several years ago and it was about how about systems change. So if there's like a meeting, and this was talking about gender, but I think this would be true. I don't think it's only about gender. This was talking about women and men specifically, but I think it would be true for women. Women, well, you'll hear what I mean. So if a woman, it, let's say it's a business, uh, a conference, um, something, and they're talking about how much money could be made in that quarter if the company did this or that. And a woman, this we're talking about, if a woman speaks up and says, well, I understand we could make more money, but the tests aren't in, we're not sure that the chemical in that pesticide might not hurt a child's brain. So she's going against the economic imperative, uh, the amoral economic imperative, even immoral economic paradigm of that system. And if she, only one woman speaks up, everybody will get quiet, afraid to say anything, and she will be, will just forget that awkward moment. But this article was saying, if even one man, yeah. and I think it would be even one woman, I like to think it would be even one, would say, actually, I agree with her. The whole system will change and the conversation cannot go back to what it was. Yeah. That's how much difference one voice will make. So I don't think it's even just a matter of, am I willing to go out there? It's also a matter of, am I willing to stand up for another person who's going out there? And uh, I will not be shut up. I will not shut up. When I see lies said about them, will I say something? When I see them mocked, will I say something? That's what it's going to take. It's going to take not only our individual choices to go out there, but our individual choice to support those who go out there and say what in our hearts we believe as yeah, well. Yeah, I totally I agree with that. The zeitgeist of the moment. The zeitgeist of the moment is America is flummoxed and trying to figure it out. You know, I've had a career being very up close and personal with people who just got bad news. That's been my career. And when people first get bad news, several things happen. First of all, a lot of ultimately meaningless preoccupation that has dominated our lives just falls away. Secondly, you realize how smart and focused you can be that all that stupid stuff having fallen away, you have the capacity to get real and get deep because this is serious. And the next thing is you don't necessarily act immediately. You have to like figure out what's happening. So I don't think Americans are apathetic. I think Americans are, are going like, wait, what's happening? And I think actually the election results the other night showed some movement in the direction of, hey, we gotta we got we got bring some balance back here. We've gotta bring some center back here. Uh, Churchill said, that you can always count on Americans to do the right thing uh, as, uh, after they have exhausted every other option. <laughs> and history proves that. History proves that we are distracted, we are superficial, we are entitled, um, and therefore we are slow to get it. But also history proves that when we do get it, we slam it like, nobody's, like nobody else. And I think that's the zeitgeist of this moment. We're getting ready to show who we really are. There are those, the, it, the realization that if we do not proactively choose for the possibilities of the human race, you, humanity is on a collision course with itself in terms of climate, in, ter, uh, climate, in terms of biochemical uh, disaster, in terms of, of, of um, nuclear possibilities. And I think we are realizing 
that if we do not choose proactively for the light here, we are going to dis descend into an authoritarian dystopia, and we're getting it all together. We're attending conferences like this. We are talking to our friends. You know, Mary, one of the things I realized, Americans, if you talk, if anybody in this audience, in talking to each other, we get deep, we get real as much as anyone else, but our political conversations are so superficial and determined by an establishment who talks to us like we're in the seventh grade in order to perpetuate their own power and money. We're recognizing that and people are ready and people can get it real. Do not count out the Americans. History would say, just, just, you just wait, this thing's not over. It's the 11th hour, but it is not midnight yet and I believe with all my heart, we are gonna slam it like nobody's business. Uh, because too many of us are sickened by the idea that we would allow ourselves to be so co-opted by a uh, by 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 real darkness and real amorality, and we don't want to die knowing that we didn't do everything we could while we were here. I'm counting on that side of us, and and I know you've been out there in the political field. I've been out there. My experience of audiences tells me that people not only are ready for that, but want that. I think that's what we yearn for, and I think the activation is happening right now. That, to me, is the zeitgeist of this moment. Oh, amen. We're gonna slam it like nobody's business, baby. And speaking of slamming it like nobody's business, we're gonna give the audience an opportunity to slam some questions our way. Uh, so while they're gathering the mics and getting everything set up again, we wanna thank the Chicago Humanities Festival for hosting this. We were riding in the car with Bill Marianne, and he told us, what, 30 years they've been rocking like this? <laughs> this is a beautiful Congratulations, thing. Chicago. You guys are so blessed, Chi-Town, to have this outlet, and now that uh, the pandemic has let up somewhat. Now, I'm of the mind, Marianne, that the pandemic is not truly over. We might be done with it, but it ain't done with us. But the fact that we can gather like this is a truly a beautiful thing, and that the Chicago Humanities Festival has provided the opportunity for this gathering. It does my heart so much joy. And then they gave you and I a vehicle to yeah, be in public. Yeah, we've been talking public. about wanting to do this. Yeah, we're, we're, we're in private together. a lot, but now we out here all out front. Everybody know about our love for one another. <laughs> we're out it. We're out. <laughs> well, we've been, we share some of the same scars. Yeah, we do. Same inner scars. We're gonna share we more. Like Pardon? We are gonna share more scars. Well, let's be each other's medicine as yeah, well. Yeah, let's do that. We're going to do that. So, yes, let's do it. Uh, where are the mics? <coughs> with, uh, whoever. And I hope for the questions and answers are going to turn on some lights so yeah, we can who's see who's running, running the show. <coughs> oh. Yeah, we see beautiful faces. as you started the conversation talking about the force for good in organized religion going back to abolitionists and today I feel like there's a movement of fundamentalism that is going against love and compassion and, and the gospels across Islam, Orthodox Judaism, Catholicism, black churches, whatever you want to look at. Is there a path forward to return to those core values that can move us back to love and compassion and, and moving us back to the sort of promise of the gospels? Well, of course there's a path forward, but we have to articulate it and not look to institutional religious uh, forces necessarily to do so. There is, everything that you're saying is true. Um, but the point now is to realize that if they're not going to be speaking with real love, if they're not, if they're going to in some ways even speak against the principles on which their deeper religious principles purport to stand, um, then we need to do it for ourselves. That's, that's, a really, that's the American ideal anyway. We the people, not we institutional religions, not we business, not we any f sector of our society, we the people. And I think that when you see your institutions let you down, and that is an example of institutions letting us down, it actually throws us back on ourselves. I don't really care what they say. I want to tell you what I say. That's what, that's what we're all moving towards. Let me tell you what I say. Hello, my name is Drayson Williams. Glad to see you. So my question is, 
in all honesty, I didn't vote this time. I'm just, <laughs> I'm sort of tired of hearing that democracy is dying, is we're moving towards authoritarianism every election when if you've worked in communities with large concentrations of black folks, you've realized that democracy has been dead, that there's an over surveillance, poverty rampant. I mean, there is no, there is no reason for anyone in the hoods to be going out to vote and trusting some of these politicians with their lives, honestly, in my opinion. And so my question to you all would be, is there a place for honesty in our politics about what is already here, but who it's happening to? Because every time I hear democracy is dead, uh, and all these people run out to vote. They're running out to vote because they're scared of it coming to their communities and not necessarily what's already been happening in communities with black folks, especially the black kids. I work in schools, I can tell you. It is, it's been scary for a long time for a lot of kids, for a lot of families, but no one cares. We, we, we have all these conversations we run out to vote every time it's, it's coming to a house near us or a community near us. But when it's in the hoods, when it gets worse in the hoods, everybody says, as long as it stays over there, and we keep thinking that we're making progress. And so I can go on and on about that. But do you, both of you all, do you all feel like there's a place for honesty about what's already here and who it's happening to? Would that be a, a uh, galvanizing message for Americans or does it even make sense to even bring it up? You said Williams is your last name? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Williams. Yes, and you're in that place right now. You just got to start it. Always there's a place for honesty. We just got to have people who have the courage to speak honestly. And I agree with everything that you said, although the mother in me wants to say, I can't believe you didn't go out the damn boat, you know? <laughs> However, I'm not going to, this is not to shame you in that because you have a right to be so pissed off with the system. Opting out of voting is a choice. So I want to be real with you and I understand why you made that choice, even though for me and how I was, you know, it was just my grandmother. And even though my grandma, my maternal grandmother is not here, I still think like she would like show up in form if I didn't vote, you know? So what I would say to you is that even if you are mad as hell or heaven, you still should go out to vote. And you know why I'm going to say why you should do that. And we can talk offline, but you know all the reasons why you should, from a historical perspective, why you should. But secondly, if you opt out of voting, then you allow somebody else to make a decision for you. That's my second reason. It's not my first reason. My first reason is ancestral. And we can have that conversation offline, that we owe it. We owe it. it. It might be like, dang, no, but we owe. But I get it, and there are millions of people just like you who said, the hell with this system. It doesn't work every time we go vote. Uh, your point about what's happening to the black community is real. And that ripple effect of the black community impacts every other community. So I get it. When black babies die in the streets in this city, in cities all across this country, when you have a system that yet on one hand, we've made an extraordinary amount of progress, but when we look at, let me use the wealth gap, for example, the black white wealth gap, hasn't had changed. Matter of fact, it's gotten worse in 2022. So it's kind of hard to go to the most oppressed people and say, put me in office and I'm gonna make the change. A lot of people feel like they were lied to in 2020, and guess what they were lied to? We're gonna give you $2,000 checks. Then when they get in office, it's 1,400. You know, you pass the child tax credit and you cut childhood poverty in half, and then all of a sudden, you mofos can't extend the child tax credit, and you catapult those same children and their mothers and their fathers and their community back into poverty. So yes, Mr. Williams, there is an opportunity for us to have honest dialogue. And I think you got two people up here who are willing to do it and there are other people, but you are that honest broker. It's in you. You are it. And you, not just us, it is, it's you. It starts with you. And the fact that you even asked that question and you put it out there, some politicians lie to get elected. And I'm, they, they, they will whisper the sweet nothings. And to me, my last point, 
on this because we can have a conversation offline because I get, I'm really hyped about what you just said. <laughs> I do believe that the black community in particular is taken advantage of by the Democratic Party. And we are no longer the mistress, we the side piece. At least the mistress gets some diamonds and some pearls every now and then, the side piece gets nothing. And the reason why they manipulate us and take advantage of us, and even in this city, don't even get me started, how could y'all vote for Rahm Emanuel? Jesus Christ, after Laquan McDowell, I don't get it. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but d black people like lambs to the shot, slaughter continue over 90% to continue to vote for a party that has turned its back. Now don't get me started on the Republicans and I ain't gonna let them off the hook either. Today's Republicans are an embarrassment. We have a two party duopoly where the corporatists of both parties control and they don't care about the 98% of all of us. No matter how we identify, they don't care about us. Michael Jackson had a song, they don't really care about us. We see that in politics, and baby, I hear that in the question that you pose, that we do have to both on one hand recognize the most impending threat to, America's not a democracy, so that's a lecture I can give you another time. We're trying to grow up to be one, we really are not one, but neo-fascism is a very real threat. And so we just got a decision to make. Neo-fascism kills you quick. Neoliberalism kills you slower. And so we got to sometimes vote for the lesser of the two evils, truly walk into the voting place and say, I'm, I am about to vote for the lesser of two evils. And once you reconcile that in your mind, I think it, it'll make it easier to participate in the process. Neoliberalism kills you slower. And to me, neoliberalism helps to birth neo-fascism. And that's why a Trump and the spirit of a Trump was able to rise in this country is because neoliberalism has let all of us down, but especially the most marginalized, oppressed, depressed, put upon people in this country. So yeah, we can be honest. I think I'm being a little honest with you right now, but you are the truth. You are. Is this on? Um, you just uh, hit on kind of what I was going to ask. How are we ever going to get a President Turner or a President <clears throat> Williamson if the uh, neoliberals are running the Democratic Party because they've actively worked against both of you and they've actively worked against Bernie Sanders. They've actively worked against anyone who would actually help people get health care or college like the rest of the world and most people don't know the rest of the world gets free health care and college included with their taxes. So if every election is the lesser of two evils and the evil keeps getting more evil because the neoliberals don't, Biden didn't fulfill any promise, not, not any promise. And what are, if we keep having to vote against the bigger evil how are we ever going to get a President Nina Turner, which I want? <laughs> and, or either of you, I would, I voted for both of you, so. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> I do kind of represent the Jimmy Dore aspect of the party who promoted both of you in the past. And he, people who connect people from different parties, like Jimmy Dore, like Tulsi Gabbard, like both of you are demonized like Martin Luther King. They are demonized and, you know, and then, and then people are very against Elon Musk because of the censorship, but people like what's progressives your have gotten censored. Yeah, what's your name? Well, what are we, yeah. how are we supposed to keep voting? Can we get a third party? Is that the answer? Is a third party the ultimate answer? Because how will either of you rise to the top, ever? 
Well, thank you for that. I'm gonna let I want Marianne to jump in on yeah, that. Yeah, and I want you to know, everyone, my I'm reading, uh, we're hearing aids, so I'm, I don't want you to think I'm not looking at the person who's who's asking questions. I'm just reading on the monitor what you're saying. First of all, I want to say it's it's everything Nina said about a lesser of two evils is true. We have to make a distinction between the neoliberals and the neo-fascists. It's not true to say Joe Biden did not fulfill any promises. Uh, Joe Biden did not fulfill promises at the level that we wanted. Uh, there's incremental change. It's, it's crumbs when we think it should be feasting, but it's certainly better than uh, the party that would starve you. So, um, uh, of those of certain rights and opportunities. So I, I want to say that. Um, I agree with what um, uh, Nina said before about neoliberalism will just kill you slower. Um, the Republican Party as it is constituted today represents a nosedive, a direct nosedive for our democracy. Uh, the neoliberal establishment corporatist Democrats represent a managed decline. But in that managed decline, it gives us some time. And what we need to do, and I think what both of these questions uh, recognize, we need to make a real U-turn. Franklin Roosevelt said, I have come to recognize, he said, uh, we must be fairly radical for a generation. Yes. And today, of course, Franklin Roosevelt would be considered too wild-eyed leftist to even That's be right. part of it because, um, you know, the, the, the neoliberal corporatists in the Democratic Party indicate that those of us who want this kind of radical change back to alignment with the principles on which we purport to stand are trying to hijack the party. Actually, they hijack the come party. Come on, come on. But then going back to what you said, sir, what I would hope for you is that you realize, and this, this, this really gets me, I would hope you realize how many people running for office, getting up every morning, going through hardship and betrayal and derision and beyond anything you might realize, know what you're saying to be true and that's why they're running. And that's why you must show up to help them. You think when Nina Turner ran, she wasn't saying everything you said or didn't realize it? There are people, particularly in the primaries, because you see the neoliberal corporatist establishment squashes this stuff on the level of the primaries, right. on congressional races as well as presidential races. That's, right. That's why we need you. When you see candidates who are agreeing with you, and there are many who do agree with you, who the system wants to squash, that's the reason to vote, to, but it's the reason to do more than vote, to show up at their offices, to make phone calls to canvas. And that's really the only answer, is righteousness is going to overwhelm the lie. Mm. We, a mass movement of people. The, the real problem, and I understand what you were saying, people feel the only way they have to say fuck you is to not vote. But I'd like to submit to you, it's not a functional way to say fuck you. <laughs> right? So the, 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 the thing is, when you say what, first of all, it would be a miracle for a, a, a President Turner or Williamson to get elected. On the other hand, you know, there's a saying in miracles Judaism. Miracles do happen. What? We don't believe in, what do you say? I said miracles do happen. Mir well, yeah, the Jews say we don't believe in miracles, but we rely upon them. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so the issue is, but you make a good point. Even if you got a president who was saying these things, that president, you would have to do more than that. You would have to vote for the Congress people, mm. right? But even if you didn't have a Congress, uh, even if you did have a Congress that was blocking and obstructing all the time, the president would still have the bully pulpit. The president would still have the capacity to make appointments. A real president is really standing for what we're standing for, would use the power of executive orders. Not even giving a shit where they ever got reelected, because that's not what they're there for. Come on. And they would make those changes. Yes. But once again, the people can't, uh, the people can't abdicate their responsibility to uplift whatever voices might make the changes that you want to see happen. Yeah. And we can't be an ain't it awful. We just can't be. There are times in life where you just can't give up. You have to get going. And I think this is a moment when we must get going. 24 is not far away. Yeah, it's not that far away. This has been fantastic. How much more time do we have for questions? We have one final question. One. Book signing on the second floor with the one and only Marianne Williamson. <laughs> Thank you both so very much. First of all, 
Um, I would be remiss to not mention you, you have both brought up FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt so many times on this, and synchronistically, I'm speaking with some friends of mine who are doing a docudrama based on a three-part biography by um, Blanche Wisen Cook. So I would love to, since history is such a prolific teacher, I'd love to hear a story that you think should be included. About Eleanor Roosevelt? Yes, oh, by Eleanor. It's called, it's called Eleanor. I, I mean, there are so many uh, stories about Eleanor Roosevelt that, um, that are already included in so many of those biographies. So I, I, I think we should, I think well, we we should take another. Fine. Sure, we we, talk that's fine. I mean, because yeah, any story definitely. that I know about to Eleanor Roosevelt is one that I already yeah, read already in those biographies, so. But that's a beautiful thing that they're working yeah, on. Yeah, that, that they're though. out there. Yeah, so why don't we, thank yeah. you for that. Hi, um, thank you for being here. And I'd like to know, um, how do you deal with the pain and the um, feeling gutted all the time when you're standing up for something and you're constantly being pushed down? Um, I'm a CPS or a retired CPS teacher, so I kind of have worked in the system, and um, it sometimes guts you. And it sometimes so. What do you, where do you find strength? I do want to say something to this because. I hear a lot of people these days talk about how traumatized they are, they are by the Trump phenomenon. I'm just so traumatized by it. Um, do you think the people who walked across the bridge at Selma were not traumatized? Everybody's saying, oh, I'm so anxious. It's just, this whole thing has me so anxious, really. Do you think the suffragists who were put in prison um, for uh, marching for suffrage the, the conditions in the, in the prison were so awful that they went on a hunger strike. The response of the prison officials was to send men into their, into their uh, cells and put these metal contraptions and force feed them. You think they weren't a little anxious? What about those women standing up in Iran right now? We need to toughen up, buttercups. <laughs> we need to toughen up. Of course we're pushed down. But even Americans, everybody in this room, however pushed down we are, it is nothing compared to how pushed down the Iranians are right now, and they are showing up. It is nothing compared to how the women in Saudi Arabia are pushed down. So I think we have gotten to a point where we're coddling our neuroses a little too much right now. We need to, we need to say to, to a friend, you know, who's going through it, not so much, oh, uh, you know, are you okay, are you okay? Sometimes we need to say, meditate, take a shower, pray in the morning and kick ass in the afternoon. That's what we need to be doing right now, not coddling. We, and this is not to minimize the pain. Neither one of us, we, and you, sometimes you call your girlfriends, you call the people in your life, can I share my pain? And then that call is over, and the person who loves you on that call says, promise me you're gonna get out there this afternoon and show them what you got. It's both hands, and we cannot let our upset overwhelm us. Let us not be the first generation of Americans to wimp out on doing what it takes to put this country back on track. Well, let the church say amen. Oh, this has been beautiful, Marianne, to be in this space with you. And uh, We got to do more of this. We should take the show on the road or the road on the show or <laughs> something like that. I don't know if America is ready for it. But this has been wonderful. Again, we want to thank the Chicago Humanities Festival. I think you gave your, your closing remarks, but do you want to say something? I no, mean, just uh, thank you, and it's really uh, Mike, Mic here. drop, you know, when you <laughs> drop the mic. You just say, this is good. No, this has been wonderful. And, and many thanks to all of you for being here with, the, with us. I do want to leave you with my grandmother's three bones, the wishbone, the jawbone, and the backbone. She said the wishbone is for hoping and praying because hope is the motivator, but the dream is the driver. The jawbone is for lifting your voice and speaking truth to power. But the most important bone of them all, the supercadrafragilistic expialidocious bone is the backbone. <coughs> Because the backbone will keep you standing through all of your trials and your tribulations. And this life, we are going to be tested, but you can't have a testimony without a test. And Marianne was laying out all of the testimony that we have as a nation, both the good and the bad. But there is this deep-seated reservoir of we will not give up or give out within the American DNA. So I want you to take my grandmother's three bones, and we're going to rock on. We're going to hit them hard. We're going to hit them hard. God Thank you, Chicago everyone. Humanities Thank Festival, you. for having us.